Hello everyone. Sorry we had a bit of a hiccup and a delay here. Um, it looks like we've got everything working now. Um, we will be right with you. I'm waiting on my um, Go Solar team to make their way into the room. Um, we seemed to have had some sort of technical hiccup for a minute there, but it looks like we are online now. So we'll give everybody a minute or so to get um, situated and moved over to this room since we did have a problem and we will be right with you shortly. All right, it looks like we're getting a pretty full house. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and kind of get us started here. So let me get my screen share up. go should be in presenter mode so all right well we will get this started since we're running a couple minutes behind due to our small technical delay sorry again about that folks so i am mariah williams i am the program associate here in ohio i am located in columbus um, so i'm very familiar with our area. This is our 2023 Columbus Area Solar Co-op. Um, the reach of this co-op is anything in Franklin County and then all of the touching counties. So Delaware, Union, Madison, Pickaway, Fairfield, and Licking. Um, so pretty, pretty broad reach there. So the greater Columbus area, of course. So I want to say a special thank you to our partners in this co-op um, from the city side of things. We have Sustainable Columbus and Green Columbus. Then we also have some regional partners with the Impact Community Action and Mid-Ohio Regional Planning Commission. And then we have some great support from Green Energy Ohio, the Ohio Environmental Council, Power Clean Future Ohio, and Drive Electric Columbus. So what is Solar United Neighbors? We are a vendor neutral national nonprofit and we help people to go solar by joining together and then fighting for energy rights. Sun got started in 2007 when Anya, our founder, who's in the center of that picture, wanted to go solar um, because her son had saw Inconvenient Truth, um, the Al Gore film, and asked about it. And whenever she started looking into it for their own home, she found that it was much more difficult than she thought it would be, and that there was a lot of red tape um, and bureaucracy, bureaucracy involved. And so she said, if we're going to go solar, we'll just take some of our neighbor's solar with us. And so they went around and they talked to people, and overall, 50 homes in the Mount Pleasant neighborhood of DC ended up going solar through that first, what ended up being a co-op. Um, so in 2011, lots of calls were coming in and people were saying, how can we go solar too? And so they founded DC Sun um, and developed the programs to help manage, you know, people going solar on co-ops throughout the District of Columbia. So now we've got a national impact. Um, we're in 12 states, the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico. And so, so far we've helped 6,500 families go solar um, through 300 and 
40 plus solar co-ops, which equals out to 65 megawatts of solar and 739,000 tons of CO2 saved. And then on a more local impact, um, since 2015, we've had an Ohio program. We've had 603 households go solar with us for a total of 4.5 megawatts of installed capacity, which has invested about $12 million in local solar here in the state of Ohio for $16 million in energy savings estimated for the next 25 years. Um, 90 solar jobs have been created and 170 million pounds of carbon emissions have been avoided. Part of the work we do is working to make a more equitable energy system. Um, we don't want to continue to have children growing up with the background of a power plant um, with the toxic pollution that those spread. So Part of what we do with that is how we work with things like Impact. Um, they have a program called Empowered, which trains local solar installers. Um, so they've got students in cohorts right now um, that are learning about different construction trades and electrical trades. Um, so they go out on the job sites with our installers to see how solar is installed. And then they are able to pursue jobs with these installers um, because they've got good training behind them. So a bit of what we'll cover today is solar technology. Um, that'll be the first section. Then solar economics and how solar co-ops work. So our first section is solar technology. So today and what we do in our co-ops is cover solar photovoltaics, which convert solar energy to electricity. And those are just more simply put, those solar panels that we see on rooftops and on ground mounts. So each panel is made up of several different layers. Um, there's a frame that holds everything together and helps protect the edges. There's glass that helps to, you know, protect the top surface. Um, and then there's an encapsulant inside of there. You'll find the solar cells, which are what actually, you know, collect and produce that energy. And then there's another layer of encapsulant so that these are weatherproof. Um, and then there's the back sheet and the junction box. And we find that these wear very well. Um, they usually come with like a 20 or 25 year warranty, depending on the manufacturer. Um, so they stand up to all the wind, um, storm, hail, anything else that Ohio weather will decide to throw at them. So one of the roof components that if you're not an installer, um, you might not know about is racking. So here you can see the normal type of racking that goes in on a shingle roof um, that we do have most of us have here in central Ohio. So these mount through your roof boards. Um, they have special seals that they put around those to make sure that they are weather tight and they do guarantee those. Um, and then they mount the panels on those. And they also can work on slate roofs. So if you're thinking to yourself, oh no, I don't have shingles, I have a slate roof, not to worry. They do have um, the ability to use those on those slate roofs. That racking does cost a tiny bit more. So it's something that you'll have to factor in if you decide to go that route and you do have a slate roof, um, but they'll evaluate your roof and help you figure that out. And then they can also mount these on um, standing seam roofs or metal roofs. They just use a different little clamp that works by holding on to those standing seams of the roof. And then if you have a flat roof, like if you're a small business or a nonprofit going to go through the co-op with us, or if you have a unique styled home, um, they may use a ballasted system. And in that case, what they'll do is they'll evaluate your roof to make sure that the building is structurally sound to hold that additional weight, because those are weighted systems, um, but they are a little bit easier to move because there's no penetrations for those. And if you are in one of our outside um, of the perimeter 
kind of areas and you've got a little bit more yard space, what you might find is that you want to go ground mount. Um, those systems are available as well. There's usually an additional small fee for the um, trenching in those systems. So that's a cost though that'll be listed off on all the bids that we get. Um, so we can help to factor that in for you. And then outside of racking in the panels, there are other system components like your inverters. Um, there's a couple different types. And whenever you're getting your um, installation proposal, which are individually done with the installer that gets selected through the co-op, they will talk to you about which type of inverter will work best. Um, if you want like a string inverter with some optimizers, or if you will want micro inverters, um, and there's different purposes for each of those. You know, in most cases um, in Central Ohio, we it typically looks like we get string inverters with the optimizers put on them to help the systems work most effectively and efficiently. Um, but they'll they'll address those with each individual system to make sure that it's right for you. And then a piece that we hope you don't have to have replaced, but that we try to give you a heads up on is your electrical panel. So your solar connects to your electrical panel um, through an additional breaker space. So if you've got a panel that's older, um, if you have a very small panel for your home, maybe you live in an old home that only has a 75 amp service panel, or if you've got a lot of other things already plugged into your panel, you know, maybe you've got you know, a fun house that has a pool and a hot tub and a kiln um, and all your breaker space is used, then they may have to get you a new breaker panel, um, a larger one, so that you have that space available. But most homes do not need upgrades before they are able to go solar. So what's a good roof fit for solar? Um, so the first thing we'll look at um, whenever we give you a free roof evaluation as part of this process is which direction your roof is facing. So here in Ohio, um, we're in the northern hemisphere and we do not recommend a northern facing roof because it is not as efficient. East and west make pretty good lays for your roof, but south is the best. So if you've got a southern facing roof or, you know, an east and west garage or, you know, what have you, um, those are all things that will help you evaluate and look at. And then we also want to make sure you have little to no shading. The tree canopy is great and wonderful and we encourage you to keep it and maintain it. Um, we don't want you taking out those trees because they are good for sequestering carbon, but you know, at the same time, they do shade your roof and might make it so that your solar wouldn't be economically feasible. Um, so that is something that we take into account, as well as is there enough roof space for your panels? Um, so if you've got 250 or so square feet of roof, you've probably got enough for a small system and we can look at helping you out with that. But um, if you've got tons of dormers or a bunch of weird angles on your roof, if you've got a round roof or something, then those are all things that we will have to take into account and see if you have enough space for there to be a good system. And then one factor that we don't have mentioned on this page, um, but that does play in is the age of your roof or the condition of your roof. So if you've got a roof that's at the very end of its lifespan, um, you're going to want to replace that roof prior to installing installation of panels just so that you don't have to go through the added immediate expense of moving those panels, having roof repairs done or your roof replaced and then the panels put back up. Um, while solar companies will come back out and take those panels down and store them and then put them back up for you, there are fees involved with that. Um, so you don't want to accrue those if you don't have to. So you'll want to Make sure your roof is in good condition first um, and any reputable installer will check that roof make sure that's the case um, before they do installs because they do not want to inherit problems for your roof and then some of the important terminology that you'll hear throughout this is kilowatts which are the measurement um, of the system and what its output is kilowatt hours, which is how much production your solar would make over the course of a day, how much energy your house needs over the course of a day. Um, and the way I like to keep track of those two words is that I like to think of kilowatts as like a garden hose um, and kilowatt hours as the thing that I'm trying to fill. 
So let's say that you have, you know, a very small house. You've got a kiddie pool size house and you're wanting to fill it up over the course of the day. You could use a garden hose to do that. But if you have a big house and big energy needs, maybe you have that kiln and you have um, a electric vehicle and you have a hot tub and you're running those things all the time and you need lots of power for them. Obviously, a garden hose is going to take a very long time to do that. So you're going to want something bigger like a fire hose. Um, so, But they'll help you right size your system as this process goes along to make sure that you're getting those two parts matched up, that you're not getting too big of an array for your house um, and making more energy than you're supposed to, or that you're not getting too small of a system that doesn't, you know, meet your needs at all um, and isn't going to be as economical for you as something that is right sized. So the average size of a system here in Ohio is six to seven kilowatts and that is based on you know your budget, your energy needs, what your goals are, um, if you're wanting to cover 100% of your consumption or if you're just wanting to cover a portion of it, you know maybe you're just trying to offset usage of some particular thing. And as you can see in these pictures, um, there's a little guy here standing and he's to represent that each panel is about three feet wide and about five feet tall. So this array pictured um, is a 12 panel array and it would be worth about 4.2 um, on scale. So. And then you're probably wondering, I mentioned extra energy. So what happens if you are producing more energy than your house can use at any given moment? And that's whenever net metering plays in. So here in our area, uh, the net metering through most of the major electric utilities, if you do have one of the outlier companies like um, Union Rural Electric Cooperative, for example, let me know and we will look into what the net metering policy is with them. But if you've got any of the big players, the Community Choice Aggregation Program or AEP Ohio or AEP Energy, then this your net metering here in the area is a one-to-one -one credit. So for every one kilowatt hour of energy you push out to the grid, you earn one credit for one kilowatt hour of energy later. Um, and that is on the generation side only. So those transmission and distribution fees aren't offset unless you're producing a lot of extra energy. Um, but the generation is what really, you know, hits us the most. Um, so whenever you're producing energy in the middle of the day, like today at, you know, high noon, um, my system was producing a little over 10 kilowatts, um, which was far more than we could use even whenever we had a vehicle plugged in. And, you know, our whole household, we were still pushing about um, three kilowatts out to the grid um, at any given moment. So we were earning back credits that we'll use here overnight um, to offset any of our bills um, that we are accruing. So the solar panel panels are absorbing that energy. They're pushing it into your inverters and converting it from DC off of the panels to AC that your household can use. Um, and then your meter is a bi-directional meter that can read the energy both being pulled from the grid or being pushed out to the grid um, so that you get your energy back into it. And we can simplify this. So we've got a little electric bill here, which is far simpler than any electric bill you'll actually ever see in your mail. Um, and this shows that if you were an average household using 1000 kilowatt hours per month, and you were making, you know, some of your energy that you're using, plus you're exporting a little bit of energy, and you exported 500 kilowatt hours, that the amount left on your bill is just going to show that leftover 500 kilowatt hours that you didn't offset. So, and this, you know, doesn't reflect your self usage. Um, that seems to confuse people a lot. You can get an energy monitor that will help show you what you actually produced, um, what you used yourself, and then how much you pushed out. Um, but overall, that lets you, you know, get a basic breakdown of that. So, um, one of the big questions we always get is what happens when the power goes out? So, whenever the power goes out, 
your solar does have to shut off. Um, that's a safety mechanism to keep you from frying any of those linemen. Because however we might feel, feel about our overall utilities, uh, those linemen are just average everyday folks trying to do us a good service and we don't want to toast them. So if you do want to maintain having electricity whenever your power goes out from your solar or otherwise, you'll want to have battery backup. Um, there's another device out there called the Inphase IQ8, which is a type of inverter. Um, they do have like a little dark start battery off of those, and then they have the ability to island your house and let you use the solar only whenever it's out. Um, so you would have energy during the day, probably whenever you most want it for, you know, running your cooling systems or running, you know, some of your other um, small things around the house. But then, of course, whenever the sun sets, um, your energy would dissipate again and turn back off. Um, so that is something to keep in mind if you're not wanting to invest in batteries, that there are other things you can ask about. Um, but those are all discussions that once we have selection committee and we have an installer, you can tell them, hey, you know, it's really important to me that I have power all the time um, because, you know, I have frequent utility outages. Maybe you're in one of those areas of town that you know, AEP likes to flip the switch on a little more often, or maybe you have some critical loads at home, you know, grandma lives with you and she's on oxygen and you don't want her shut off. Um, so that's something important to you. Or maybe you're like me and you have a sump pump that every time it even thinks about rain, my basement would draw wet otherwise. And so it's really important that that sump pump is working. Um, or maybe do you, maybe you're one of our preppers and you just want to be ready in the case of zombies or some other type of emergency. And, you know, you might want to get batteries and have storage for that energy for that capacity as well. Um, so no matter what the reason, we're not judging you. Um, you might want to have a battery at home. So that's something that you can, you know, opt into. That's an optional part of the co-ops. That is not anything that's required. So, and if you are wanting more information on batteries, we have a nice battery guide available at solarunitedneighbors.org slash storage. And if you don't remember that address or don't have it written down, not to worry. Um, you can absolutely find that information on our website by searching in the search box for battery, storage, backup, um, any number of words that make sense to find that. Um, so that resource is something that you can find quite easily. And then the last optional um, component of the EV is EV charging. Um, so you might be thinking, you know, why would I want to add an EV service supply equipment piece now um, versus sometime later? There's installation savings because you're already going to have an electrician there on site with you um, whenever they're installing your solar. So you're not having to pay that like fee for them to come back out to your house. You're future proofing your garage and driveway in case you do purchase an EV. Um, and if you don't think you'll ever purchase an EV, you can always opt into um, an outlet box instead, um, because like you can see down there on the bottom of the picture, that's an outlet box. Um, that would work for an RV, a kiln, um, a second dryer in your garage. Um, so you could use something like that for any number of other uses. And a lot of times they're ordering those pieces in bulk as well. Um, so they'll pass those savings along to you. So before we dive into the solar economics, I've seen that we are quite busy in chat. Um, is It looks like Fatima has been handling most everything, but is there anything um, that I can expand on or dive into for anybody? Uh, Maria, I think at this moment we are good. All the questions have been answered. We can carry on. All right. Well, thank you very much for taking care of those, Fatima. Um, and as you've probably been watching for yourselves, there is a nice chat box there that you can enter any questions you're coming up with in. Um, if she's not able to answer them for some reason, um, she'll direct them to me whenever we take one of these pauses and otherwise um, she'll pop you up some answers there, which is super handy. And that way you can, you know, see, see all those bits later. Um, so let's talk now about a bit of the solar economics.
So solar is a great investment. Um, over the past several years, we've watched as costs of it have dropped. Um, back in the early 2000s, it was considered a boutique item. Um, so the costs of it were quite high. Um, nowadays, it has a fairly solid return on investment, um, along with having a 30% federal tax credit, which just um, went back up thanks to the um, Inflation Reduction Act that was enabled last fall. Um, it was down to 26% and going to drop to 22% this year. But again, that is back up to 30%, which is a nice offset. And then co-ops help to reduce the cost of solar installations in a few ways. There's soft costs that we don't think about like advertising and then having to pursue people and help educate you. There's labor costs um, whenever they're having to hire crews seasonally and then lay people off and then hire them seasonally and lay them off. Um, it creates a cycle of them having to pay a premium to get that labor. Um, so this can help to offset that for them um, and then they can pass it along. And then those system components are the biggest part of how we help to reduce costs because they're able to order them um, all the pieces in bulk to service the co-op and so they're able to get that discount. Um, last year we seen that the co-op was big enough that they were able to order one entire shipping freight container of the panels um, where usually they're ordering them you know a pallet or two at a time. Um, so that offered a significant savings to the installer, which they then passed along to the co-op. Um, and as mentioned briefly before, there is a federal tax credit. Currently, that is sitting at 30% and will remain there until 2032. And then it is set to sunset off um, by stepping down from 26% in 2033 and 22% in 2034 before it will disappear entirely. So we should have a good long window um, for everybody to consider solar and then add it whenever they're ready. So let's look at a little simple breakdown of what the potential price is um, for your installations. So our co-ops here in Ohio are currently running at about $2.70 a watt, which is a 30 cent or so savings over the average market rate. Um, so that means if you're installing that average system or roundabout there of a five kilowatt system, your price would come in at $13.5 um, for the out the door price. Then you would get back a federal tax credit next year whenever you file your taxes. Um, and that is worth $4,050. Let's say that you don't have that much tax liability. Um, no worries. You are able to space that out and take little parts of it for five years. So as long as you had 800 or so dollars a year in tax liability, you could take 800 each of those five years and get it back. So you can take it in little increments if needed. Um, but I think most people who are investing $13,000 in their home usually have $4,000 in tax liability um, and are able to take that size chunk in one block. Um, but that would bring your net cost down to $94.50. We estimate that each year you're going to save about $754 on power savings, which means that over the lifetime of your system, you'd be saving about $22,000 um, in power costs, which would mean that you'd end up with a net profit by the time that system is 25 years old of $13,188. I mean, obviously, this is not like a get rich quick scheme, and it's more that it's setting offsetting an existing cost that you have and that you won't be paying as much for your electricity bill. Um, but it does tidy up to, you know, having a good return on investment for people. And there's obviously a bunch of different factors in that return on investment, because um, if you use less energy or you have a bigger system or you use you know, more energy or you're offsetting other costs like your fuel costs for your vehicles, um, it balances out a little bit faster. So there are some different financing options. Um, there's a rural electric program um, grants 
that are offered through REAP. Um, those are not going to work for most of our participants unless you're some of those outlying areas um, because it goes off of community size. Um, so anything that's basically everything in Franklin County is going to disqualify off of that unless it's an out out farm. Um, your home equity line of credit usually is one of your best things to look at for financing, um, including refinancing to include your solar. Um, some of the installers will offer financing, which you just want to watch out for any extra fees that they have on there. Um, there's the Clean Energy Credit Union, which is a credit union that specifically deals with um, solar, wind, um, electric vehicle kind of purchases, heat pumps, things like this. So they won't do loans on anything else. So they have a really good program and solid support um, system for those. And then there are EcoLink subsidized loan programs um, here in Ohio. So if that's something that you're wanting to pursue, there's an EcoLink website. You can look into more information. Um, the last time I was checking it, it looked like it was setting about 3% off of the loans for the first four years um, of the loan term. Um, so that can help you out to have a little bit lower um, interest rate on entry to the loan. Um, and then what will happen if you're interested in that, just let the installer know and they will help you out. Um, most of them have a bank in the area that they work with to help get those subsidized loans. And we have a little breakdown here of an example of the financing costs um, of those loans. So if you're looking at that five kilowatt system and you did take out like that subsidized loan, so you got your percentage down to about 4% um, and you made a payment of $96 for 10 years, um, you can see that it equals out to paying it for your monthly payment of $96. Um, you'd have your energy savings of 63 on your power bill. So you're making, you know, a net payment of $33 a month. And if you did end up taking out that 7% loan, um, which is about where we're seeing them sit right now, um, then you'd be looking at $110 a month in payments. Um, so your net payment would be um, $47 after you'd offset that $63 worth of your electric bill. Um, so that shows you a little bit about how those, this is obviously very simplified. Um, your loan will look customized to, you know, you um, and your system costs, but we just try to break it down a little bit so that you have an idea of what you might be looking at. So do we have, we've got a bunch more questions going by. Um, so is there anything about financing that we can help walk through here? One question I have is about energy credits. Um, uh, a member is asking, what is the average of energy credit that system can generate? Is there some historical data that shows I will be safe? Um, so systems are allowed to generate up to 120% of your normal energy usage um, here in like AEP coverage area. So let's say that on average you use a thousand kilowatt hours a month. Um, that would mean that you can make up to 1200 kilowatt hours a month that you are, you know, pushing out to the grid um, before the company would change you into a generator versus a consumer, which is a very bad thing. You don't want that letter. I don't want to hear that you got that letter um, because, the, you know, AEP does not want you to become a competitor to them um, for generation of supply. So that 120% is the maximum. Um, most installers are going to try to keep you at 80% because that's kind of the sweet spot for both making, you know, your system economical and have a good return on investment as well as making sure that overall over the course of a year that you aren't going to you know have too many months that you are generating more energy than you're using um, it is completely possible um, here in central ohio to completely offset your bill um, and sometimes even make a little bit back i usually run with um, zeroed out bills um, in february march and april or so um, and then 
again in October and November. Um, and then during the summer months, whenever I'm producing a whole lot more energy, um, I usually have a credit. So we pay tiny bills in December and January of about $29. Um, or so. And then the rest of the year, we don't have any electricity bills anymore um, because we're just offsetting that much of it. So we're able to offset not just our generation of any power that we don't make ourselves, but our transmission distribution and any of the other fee fees that they came up with. Um, so, but that all depends on who your energy supplier is and what your interconnection agreement with them is. Um, and that's, that's something that you'll look over as you're, you know, coming to terms and letting your power company know that you are going to go solar so hopefully you, that helped answer yeah, that and you covered uh, transmission and distribution also so i guess we have more clarity on that so another quick question will my house insurance increase because of the installation um, that will depend on your insurance company. Um, I can speak to my own personal scenario. My house insurance actually went down, um, not by much, not by enough that I counted as really going down, but it was like a $20 a year on my policy savings um, that happened because of it. But in my case, it was because of the energy backup portions of my solar. Um, so because we do have that sump pump that I mentioned earlier that likes to run a lot and my insurance company is aware that we have, you know, water drainage issues if the sump pump isn't running, then because now they didn't have to worry about that being a cost um, and an expenditure for them as much that my basement wasn't going to flood, that they actually lowered my insurance. Um, but we don't usually see anybody's insurance increase um, by much. They just consider this a portion of your house, but that's something that you'll want to check on with your individual policy. Um, you'll also want to let them know if you do have to get a roof replacement prior to solar because some of the newer roofing materials um, also get you a discount. So we, we had a reduction in our bill first whenever we got a new roof to prepare for solar and then another reduction whenever we went solar. Um, so it actually provided us with an insurance savings instead of any type of increase. Awesome, thank you. And the last question we have, I don't know if you have a specific number for this. What is the average electricity produced by a five kilowatt system per month? Um, that's, I mean, that's a great question, but it's it's got a lot of factors that are going to play into it. Um, so it's it's going to be a little difficult to come up with one set number. Um, so they're going to look at you know, obviously over the course of a day, you're not making five kilowatts in the morning and you're not making it in the evening, um, but you're going to make it across the middle part of your day. You're going to peak out that system and make that full five kilowatts, maybe just a little bit more because of how the inverters work. Um, so you're going to balance out and usually at the end of the day, um, that size system would have produced um, enough to offset your normal household usage. Um, but it's, it's hard to calculate an exact number because, you know, we're not, we don't know all the factors that are going to go into your roof and your house um, with it. Um, I mean, if I had to guess, I'm, I'm trying to do math in my head here. Um, so I would say round about probably 25 kilowatt hours. Um, on an average house with a five kilowatt system in the course of a day. Um, but that's a that's a big guess on my part um, just because of all those other factors. Does that sound about right to you, Fatima? Mm -hmm. Yeah, 20 to 25, but as you're saying, it depends on a lot of factors. So we won't stick to a number like shading, weather conditions, like, like micro weather conditions and so many things. So. Yeah, so mm -hmm. I mean, and if that suits your energy needs, if you're, you know, you, you've got small energy usage or you've got a very balanced load in your house, um, then that will work perfectly well. Um, so there's nothing wrong with a five kilowatt system um, versus, you know, having a larger or an even smaller system. Um, in our last co-op, we had systems ranging from a 2.8 kilowatt system that works perfectly great for the family that installed that up to like a 19 kilowatt system um, for a family that had an electric vehicle and a hot tub. Um, so they had a much higher energy usage than the, you know, 
double income, no kids family that was installing it too. So um, they're, they're, you're going to want that system right sized for you, um, no matter what system size it ends up being. So, yeah, um, and probably that's the question you would have with your installer. So that's the time when you would be discussing it with your installer. So yes, Maria, yeah. thank you so much for answering all the questions. And this is it. We can uh, move on with the presentation. Yeah, and part of, so as we move into household or co-ops work, I'll take a minute to explain part of the, whenever you're meeting with the installer and they help to right size your system, they're going to provide you with a sheet um, that gives you a nice breakdown and shows you what energy production is expected for the system that they're estimating out for you. Um, and, you know, what, when you would expect to have a return on the investment, you know, when that system would recoup its original costs. So they have a nice, you know, breakdown and they'll do that with you off of your roof, off of your power bills that you provide to show your energy needs. Um, so there's, there's a whole lot of factors in this beyond just, you know, I want to put a panel on my roof. Um, so, but let's talk a little bit more about how do solar co-ops work? So some of the reasons that you might want to join a solar co-op is that you get a best value in the installation, because as I mentioned, we're saving um, 10 to 15 percent off of the market rate with most of our co-ops. You get support throughout the process. We have, you know, little classes like we're having tonight, um, usually without the technical hiccups, but we, we work through them no matter what it is. Um, we have in-person info sessions will come out and meet with you, you know, at your home if that's something that you've got questions about that, you know, we're not able to answer by phone with you. We've got ways that you can sign up to talk to somebody like Fatima over the phone um, or, you know, we can connect you with fellow solar enthusiasts. Maybe whatever we're saying to you isn't, you know, striking the bell the same way that you need it rung and so maybe you know hooking you up with one of your neighbors that has already gone solar will let you get your questions answered um so we can help do that and then it lets you become part of the growing solar movement um, which is always kind of handy to have so we just launched this solar co-op this is our very first um, formal info session for it we'll be running these for the next three or four months um, every couple of weeks we'll have one either in person or online or hybrid programs that are both um, so you can attend these these are absolutely free to attend there's no obligation to go solar or to you know complete the co-op process um, we have the online registration open, which you can find at solarunitedneighbors.org slash Columbus. Um, so you can join the co-op if that's something you're interested in, um, which at that time we'll collect from you your name, um, email, phone number, your address so that we can provide you with that roof assessment um, because we'll look into what the shading and spacing of your roof is. I mean, you can spread the word to other folks because the more people that join, you typically the better prices that we see. Um, so we'll select an installer. Um, so next month on May 25th, so almost exactly a month from now, we're going to have selection committee, which is something that you are absolutely encouraged and welcome to join and participate in. So what will happen is that night we'll meet for about two hours. Um, prior to that meeting, we will send you a nice sheet. Um, it's a spreadsheet and it has all of the details about each of the bids that you'll receive on it. That was my favorite way to look at it whenever I went through the co-op because it was so much more simplified. Um, we also will send you the links to the folders that contain the full bids from everybody. Um, the year I went through, we had seven bids put in, and it was nearly 800 pages of reading materials, which my husband thought was just the greatest thing he'd ever encountered. And he read through pretty much every page of it because that's who he is. So if you're an energy nerd or you're an electrical engineer like he is, and that is something that you want to dive into, then you'll have that available as well. Um, but then we'll meet on May 25th so that you can talk it over with the rest of the co-op members. Um, we'll review the bid sheets um, with you. We 
before that night, we will, Fatima and I will sit down and call all the references that they provide us, along with checking on things like the Better Business Bureau, Angie's List, Solar Reviews, um, a number of other ways that we have to, you know, find out Know, how long they've been in business and how well they really do follow through on what they say they do um, so that we know that those are a, a bit of a background vetting um, process for them and we'll put all that information on that spreadsheet as well and then we look for co-op volunteers um, people like you that will say yes I want to give up two hours of my time to go talk to everybody and say hey I've looked over the spreadsheet and I think this is the best one and it's who I'm voting for you should vote for them too or say hey I don't care about who we do vote for but I want to eliminate this company because and name off your reason um, so so, and it goes both ways. Some people are all gung-ho for one company. Other people are all gung-ho against the company. Um, and, you know, it's just a good conversation to be had. Um, and at the end of the night, we will have one co-op installer selected um, from that process. So we, we just sent out the RFP because we'd hit it to our 30 members as a base um, that we were looking for. So we've sent out the RFP to the installers. So they'll start sending in their bids. Um, so we'll have that information available um, in the coming weeks and start getting our spreadsheets ready. So if you're wanting to volunteer for the co-op selection committee that is on that sign up form it's just a little box that you checked um, so that will be available to you to you know say yes I want to volunteer or no I don't um, and either way is okay um, there's some other questions like what is your roofing material what factors are important to you like you know do you only want America made things do you only want local trained people hired by the companies do you not care about any of that and warranty is the most important um, and any of those that you select off will factor in and on that spreadsheet there's all kinds of like demographics about the co-op you know how many people have slate roofs or want ground mounts or are looking for the best pricing versus american-made items um, and we'll have the co-op voting group um, remember those types of factors during the selection committee um, and then after we've went through selection, our sign up deadline is August 28th. Um, there will between May and August, there will be proposals issued to the individual members um, by the installer that gets selected. You'll sign the contract and that is directly with the installer. Um, that is between you and that installation company, not us. Um, we do not sell or install the panels. We're neutral to whoever does sell or install those panels. But whenever the co-op comes to a close and all those installations start happening, Fatima and I will be meeting weekly with that solar installer that's selected to go over with them and make sure that they are, you know, following the proper bid pricing um, to everybody to make sure that they are, you know, tracking through that process and getting everybody installed in a timely manner um, and to make sure that, you know, folks are happy with their overall installs because we check back in with you guys too. Um, and then somewhere down the road, we will have a party where we'll get everybody back together, um, meet all the new solar neighbors, celebrate um, everybody getting installations. In the case of last year's co-op, which launched in July um, here in the Columbus area, then it closed out uh, like November, I think it was right around Thanksgiving. Um, and we've had installations happening. We're getting ready for some of our final ones. Um, now that the weather's gotten better and they're back to working daily on those. Um, so we've been seeing that getting wrapped up and we just had our party along with our friends from the 2020 and the 21 co-ops um, since they had not been allowed to get together to celebrate during their years. Um, so we had a big party um, last week, which was nice to get everybody together and meet everybody and launch this co-op. So that's that's the basic breakdown of the co-op timeline. Um, but there will be installs that start before, most likely start before the final deadline for sign up, um, because with a May selection committee, um, the permit process has been running really quick here in Columbus. We're a soul smart gold city. So they've been able to um, knock that out for everybody in 24 to 
48 hours in most cases, so your permits are through. Um, so it's just however long it takes them to get equipment. Um, so I would say within probably six weeks of that selection committee date that we'll start seeing the first installs um, happening, So which will be fun. So what's next? If you haven't already, you can complete the solar co-op um, registration form that is again at solarunitedneighbors.org slash Columbus. Um, it'll ask you, you know, for your basic information along with a copy of one month of your power bill. And that is just so that we can look over and see what your power needs are um, and help them to figure out what the right size system is for you so that we'll be able to you know, tell you about what you should be expecting to see on your individualized proposal um, so that there aren't a bunch of big surprises. So, and again, I have been and will continue to be Mariah Williams. I am with Solar United Neighbors of Ohio. Um, I, my email address you can reach me at is ohteam at solarunitedneighbors.org. And Fatima and I will be hanging out here for a few minutes. So if you guys have got any more questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. Um, I seen one go by a few minutes ago and I'm guessing she answered it. But if you missed the presentation, we'll be getting this not only emailed to you, but this is our recorded session. So this will be up on the main co-op page as well um, so that everybody is welcome to take it in. Because we know that six to seven might work for me and you, um, but it may not work for somebody who works at this time of day. And we don't want anybody to miss this opportunity. So we record these so that people can um, view them later. So are there state or local tax credits? There are not. Um, Ohio is not the most progressive state. Um, we're not super renewable energy friendly. Um, so there are no state or local tax credits um, available, but there is the federal tax credit. So great question, wishful thinking. We're not there right now in our wonderful state. All right, well, thank you everybody for attending. And if we don't have any further questions, um, we will close this out and give everybody back a couple minutes of their day, much as prize to me is probably you since we did get started a couple minutes late. And again, thank you all for hanging out with us um, for this and bearing with us whenever we had a little bit of problems. Um, uh, the average cost that we listed off for the five kilowatt system is 13.5, so that's $13,500 um, with a $4,050 federal tax credit back on it. Um, and yes, if you are in an HOA, they do need to approve of it. Um, check your bylaws. We did pass legislation last year to make going solar within an HOA or a condo association easier. It doesn't prevent them from saying no, but it does um, make them have to have a way to say yes. Um, so if it's in your bylaws that it's absolutely not allowed, then they're allowed to stick with that. If it is not mentioned in the bylaws, which was my case, um, my, excuse me, my HOA is about 30 years old. Um, so it it's just dated enough that there weren't any rules on the books about solar. Um, and at first they tried to tell me because they didn't mention it, that it was a no. Um, but after 18 months of discussion with them, I got them to say yes, because they decided that solar is a roofing material and we are allowed to trade roofing materials out. So we were allowed to go solar. Um, but the new legislation helps in those vague cases with saying, hey, guys, you can't just say no because it's not mentioned. You have to come up with a policy on this. Um, so if you. If you do hit a no from your HOA, let us know um, and we can help put you in touch with some energy lawyers that might be able to help you um, talk through that with them. So, and thanks Bruce for signing up. We absolutely love to hear that. All right. Well, I hope everybody has a great evening. And if you come up with any other questions, again, please reach out to us at ohteam at solarunitedneighbors.org. Um, or you can catch me at any number of local events, or you can come catch another one of these info sessions in person. We've got a couple more.
coming up in May um, at the Hilliard Library and at the Franklinton Libraries. Um, and you can find those event dates and times listed on the event page of our website at solarunitedneighbors.org slash Columbus. Thank you very much and have a great evening, everybody.